For today's talk, we have Graham Moore. Um, he is a New York Times best-selling novelist and Academy Award winner, screenwriter. His screenplay for The Imitation Game won the Academy Award and WG Award for Best Adapted Screenplay in 2015. And he was also nominated for the British Academy of Film and Te uh, Television Arts and Golden Globe. His first novel, The Sherlockian, in 2010 was published in 16 countries and translated into 13 languages. The Last Days of Night, which is the book we are here for today, is his second novel and that published just last week. It's based on actual events when America was electrified and the battle between Edison, Tesla, and Westinghouse could not have been portrayed even any better. So without delaying any further, I'd like to welcome Graham Moore. Thank you. Hobble up this way. Wonderful. Thank you for such a kind introduction and for having me here. That's so nice. Um, uh, this looks worse than it is. It's just kind of inconvenient. Um, but I think it makes me look sympathetic to strangers. Um, uh, so, hi, everybody. Thanks for doing this. Um, I sort of figured I would um, talk for a little bit, and then we can open it up for a Q&A. Um, uh, I sort of, um, sometimes at these book things, people like to read from a book, but I always feel like the stagecraft of someone standing on a podium, like reading from a book that's right back there, it's like super inefficient. Um, uh, so, so let's just talk about some stuff. Um, uh, I can talk about this book and why I wanted to write it and um, how it relates to what you guys do, which you know a lot more about than I do since it's what you do all day. Um, so how did this book start? Well, for me, this book started uh, with a trip to Bell Laboratories in New Jersey uh, when I was eight, nine years old. I was nine. Um, my grandfather, I grew up in Chicago, my grandfather lived in New Jersey, and we'd sort of go out to visit sometimes, and he took, uh, he took me on this trip to Bell Labs uh, as a little kid, and one of the scientists there gave us a whole tour, and we got to see, I remember they took us into this room where uh, it had no, sound didn't bounce out off of anything, you kind of walk on this little plank and there's no echo anywhere, so it's extremely quiet. And it's like if you, you know, if you talk to someone who's directly in front of you, even a few feet, you can sort of hear them. But if you turn even slightly, you can't hear them at all. It's really it was sort of shocking, especially when you're nine. Um, and I was so moved by this um, the whole afternoon there uh, and kind of seeing these uh, scientists at work. Um, and I think it sort of, from my perspective, unearthed something or maybe a better metaphor would be to say that it planted something in my head that then forms a lot of the background of what I do now, um, which is getting to look at scientists not as these kind of mythical figures, but as people with jobs who work in a place and fight about what's in the you know, office refrigerator like you fight about at any other office. And I think that was, um, you know, I think I've noticed when people, when people kind of write about scientists, especially in fiction or in film, they tend to talk about them as if they're these kind of Merlin-like figures, these like magicians who come down from a mountaintop and bequeath these fabulous um, concepts to, to, to an unwitting populace. But, but as you guys know better than I do, like that's not how science works. That's not what they're like. It's not magic. It's work. Um, and uh, so, so that, I think, has formed a lot of the the seed of, of the stuff that I do, um, from, from writing about Alan Turing um, in The Imitation Game to, to Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla, uh, and their relationship in this book. Um, and so that's kind of, uh, that way of looking at the creation of technology and the people behind it has, I think, been a theme for, for everything that I've done. Um, you know, the way the thing that I started getting interested about with, with this book in particular, so from when I'm nine years old, we're going to cut forward, God, 20 years or something terrifying like that, um, makes me feel old, uh, to uh, the, the winter of 2010, 
a magical time in America. And uh, I, my first book was coming out, Sherlockian, was just, um, just being released. Um, and I was on a book tour, and I ended up on this road trip from Chicago, Illinois, to New York. Um, and uh, if you've ever taken the road trip from Chicago to New York, you guys will notice that uh, you drive through Pennsylvania forever. There's no start of Pennsylvania or seemingly end of Pennsylvania. It's just a thing that goes. Uh, and it, like the endless expanse of it just kind of continues. So it's the middle of the night. My friends and I are driving. Um, I took some friends with me. And we were, uh, I, I think I was driving. And you know the thing when you're tired and you just sort of chatter to stop from falling asleep at the wheel? That's what I do. Um, I chatter when I'm uh need to keep talking or need to keep awake and so I'm chattering and we drive past this Westinghouse Corporation factory um, and I was like oh George Westinghouse that's funny you never hear about George Westinghouse how come no one ever talks about George Westinghouse he was an interesting guy um, and everyone in the car is like you're right no one ever talks about George Westinghouse is there anything interesting about George Westinghouse like who was he and I sort of remember a few things kind of from some stuff I'd read way back when about his, I knew he had this conflict with Edison, something about Nikola Tesla. And, um, but so, so honestly, my friend who was sitting next to me was like, oh, maybe you should, should look into that for, for your next book. I was like, huh, that's kind of a good idea. Uh, let me check it out. And when I started reading more about this, this rivalry between Westinghouse, Edison, and Tesla, I got so excited um, because, in a sense, it felt it felt very personal. It felt very um, to me because they were going through a lot of the same things that I was. Like I had just become a professional writer. I was just um, I, like honestly had just become someone who writes and comes up with stories and makes things for a living, uh, as opposed to doing it uh, just because I loved it and. Obviously, because it's me that burst this massive existential crisis of like, what does it mean to have ideas for a living? Like, what does that what does that look like? How do you even organize your life if that's if that's what you do? And how do you stay responsible to coming up with new ideas and and having that really be a profession, a craft? Um, and when I started reading about Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla, what I got excited about was that these were three people who each had the same job. They were each these inventors, and they tackled a lot of the same problems, um, most notably the light bulb. They all worked on it, except that they didn't, I would imagine, oh, here are three guys, they're super smart, have the same job, they work on the same problems, they're interested in creating the same things. That would create some bond between them, right? Like they would like each other. When in fact, just the opposite was true. Um, they hated each other, and they hated each other so much. And, and that was so fascinating for me. Like, why did these three guys who each made, not only did they make things, they made the same thing, come to hate each other so much? And that's, that's what the book is about. Um, that was the question that I wanted to answer in writing it. And that's the question that I think is kind of turned into narrative in the context of the book. Um, and, and I think what I found is that what I got excited about from all of my reading about them, and so obviously then there's you know sort of years of research and um, going through scientific journals of the time, newspapers, biographies. Um, there's a lot of good biographies of Edison. Um, there is no kind of big scholarly biography of George Westinghouse. Um, there isn't really a proper biography of Nikola Tesla. There's a couple things, but no one is. This is shocking to me that no one has done like a real like. Doris Goodwin or someone hasn't done like a real proper Tesla biography. Because um, a lot of the sources we have on him are weird. We have his autobiography. A lot of, uh, a lot of what we know about Nikola Tesla comes from his autobiography, uh, which if you have read anything about Nikola Tesla, you can imagine is not necessarily the most trustworthy source. Um, he is a, was a colorful man who is not necessarily the best or most reliable narrator of his own uh, journey or ideas. Um, which is part of what makes him so interesting. But so what I got interested in was this idea that these three guys, Edison, Westinghouse, and Tesla, basically had these three completely different ideas, really 
philosophical ideas about what invention means, like what it means to make a light bulb. And, and this was the question that I got excited about exploring in the book. What were, what were these ideas? Um, and how did these three people, and, and how do they play out in their work? And so uh, how do they define invention and creation so differently? Um, so maybe we can talk about them one by one. Uh, Thomas Edison, certainly the most famous of this triumvirate, um, as he would be the first person to tell you, uh, were he in this room right now. Um, so Edison was kind of this great American, like rags to riches success story. He was born in Michigan. Um, he was born in Ohio and grew up in Michigan. He um, was uh, basically homeless as a teenager. He rode on the back of rail cars selling candy to the people on these trains in, in Michigan, um, like riding on the back of the cars. And he started his career because he would, uh, he had no formal education of any kind. But when the trains would stop at the local stations, he would get out and there, there was always a Western Union station attached to the train station. And he would kind of pop in and talk to the Western Union guys. And they would, this is his telling of his story, but they would always, um, though it seems to be true from what we can find, he would hear them complain about problems they were having with the equipment. Oh, we wish we had a machine that could do this. We wish, God, this thing doesn't work that well and no one at Western Union is going to fix it. And he liked machines and he liked tinkering. So he would just kind of stay there at night and like tinker with the little machines until he improved them. Um, and uh, yeah, he was 16 years old. And then he had made one improvement um, to this signal relaying device they used. Um, and he registered the patent and then sold it to him for $200. And Edison was a professional inventor. Um, and so he started out basically working for Western Union most of the time, kind of figuring out stuff that they would need and then selling them these patents. Um, and so, and then he quickly sort of starts his own company realizing that, you know, selling the patents to Western Union is not, not where the long money is. Uh, so, you know, from, from being homeless at 16, by the time Edison is 30, he lives on the largest mansion on Fifth Avenue. And it's, uh, you know, he was, and he starts this company, the Edison General Electric Company, that will one day become General Electric. And he creates really the first industrialized research laboratory, um, where he hires a hundred engineers and sticks them in a lab and sets them loose on problems. And loose might not be the best word to use there because he really didn't let them leave very much. So they were set very tightly um, on some very difficult problems. And that's how he got involved in the light bulb. I mean, Edison was this kind of like cutting edge guy. He was always on the kind of looking at new problems. And when it came to the light bulb, you know, functional indoor electrical light had been something that people had been trying to build for a hundred years by the time Edison got there. It's not like he was the first person to say, God, wouldn't it be cool if we had a light bulb? No, everyone knew it would be pretty valuable. Like it was uh, obviously useful. Um, and I would suggest there's some interesting uh, contrast that can be made between the light bulb and a lot of the technology that we talk about today, where it, because a lot of the things that turn out to be useful today are not immediately, it is not immediately apparent that they're useful. Um, you know, you guys all know better than I do that this was the big thing of the personal computer, right? Like, it, no one, not everyone thought it was going to be a useful thing. Um, and I did not think cell phones were going to be a useful thing. I'll, I'm old enough that I can call this out right now. I was like, cell phones are stupid, no one wants them. I was wrong. Um, don't take investment advice from me. Uh, but so 19th century investments, I can do that. Uh, so Edison, Edi unlike me though, Edison did know what people wanted. And, uh, and, but the light bulb was so obviously useful. So all these people have been trying to do it uh, all throughout Europe, there been various patents for various things. But Edison gets to the point in the late 1870s where he kind of looks at the territory and he says, um, I think we're about two years away. I think the general technology that we're at is about two years from a functional working indoor uh, incandescent light bulb. And takes his hundred something guys, sticks them in this lab in Menlo Park, New Jersey, and, ba and, he, and he says to them, you know, I think here's what's not working. I think this is the basic problem we're having. And this is the one issue that needs to be solved. Don't leave Menlo Park until you've solved it. Um, and throws a ton of resources at them. They kind of have everything they need. Um, and they really, 
a lot of people got frustrated in the laboratory because he had this kind of blind uh, trial and error approach. I mean, every you couldn't just tell him something didn't work. You had to show him it didn't work, which means you had to build it, have it not work, and then put a report on it or build, write a report on it, which was extremely time consuming uh, and resource intensive. Uh, and he just didn't care. He needed to know. Um, so with the light bulb, for example, it was the filament. It's the bit in the middle that glows. That was finding the exact kind of filament was the issue. Um, and what's re most remarkable about this thing of Edison's was that his two-year thing ended to be about, about right. Like he just sort of, it was this amazing like calling your home run thing. Um, and, and he was right. And in about two years, they got it working. And they started selling them. And they were expensive and they kept blowing up and people's houses got lit on fire, but nothing's perfect. <laughs> and so, so you know, he, all, he goes from being one of the most famous people in America to being probably the most famous person in America by the mid 1880s. Um, and in my mind, you know, Edison was this master of the press. He gave out, uh, he'd actually give stock in Edison General Electric to reporters who gave him favorable coverage. Um, I think there are rules against this now, I'm going to assume. Um, he was really blatant about it. He gave a bunch of stock to the head of the patent office in DC. Pretty sure that's illegal. I think that was illegal then, um, but no one really cared. Uh, he was generous with his gifts. Um, and so, and that was his thing. I mean, selling the light bulb, getting people, because people were so afraid of it. Um, and, and that was, I think, the way Edison, and he did all these interviews, all this press, um, all these editorials. I think that was his, in some sense, great gift. When I look at the kind of Edison, Westinghouse, Tesla triumvirate, I think of Edison as the salesman. Like, he's the guy who was really focused on selling the most light bulbs. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to develop this technology and then sell it to a ton of people. So here's where George Westinghouse comes in. Because um, what I would suggest is that Westinghouse was not interested in selling the most light bulbs. He was interested in making the best light bulb. Um, and so biographically, what that meant from Westinghouse's perspective was, you know, he was, of these three guys, he was the only one who wasn't, in a sense, quite as self-made. He was, uh, came from a relatively solidly middle class, upper middle class family, Pennsylvania. Um, Westinghouse made a name for himself on, like, the least cutting edge technology possible. Uh, Westinghouse uh, invented, his first big thing was he invented this really efficient air brake system for trains. He made trains break slightly more efficiently than they had previously been braking. I mean, so this is, this is like 100-year-old technology that he's improving a little bit. It's like the least sexy thing in the world from a technological perspective. Um, but the thing is, if you own a railroad, it's really valuable. Um, so he sell licenses technology to all these railroads, radically changes the way. It doesn't radically change the way. It, like, it makes trains that were already slowing down slow down at a slightly faster rate than they were previously slowing down. Uh, that's how glamorous this is. Um, but it makes so much money for the railroads, and Westinghouse gets so rich doing this, um, that they, the railroad companies don't even just, they don't just give him his own train they build him his own rail line between Pittsburgh and his home in the suburbs. Like he has his own line with his own train on it as a gift from the railroad, just to say thank you for being you. And uh, so, so Westinghouse is no, he's at this period, we're now in the 1880s, he's no like kind of cutting edge pioneer, right? That's not how anyone thinks of him. He's, he, it's like the most boring tech, tech company of the 19th century was the Westinghouse Corporation, but extremely profitable. Um, and so that's when Westinghouse um, basically looks at what Edison was doing with light bulbs and looked at what Edison was manufacturing, what he had patented, and said, this is shoddy technology. Like, this isn't very good. Edison sort of had a good idea for how to sort of make it function, but like, this sucks. This, he's not building good devices. and my team can do this a lot better. Um, and so Westinghouse, in his very 
boring old George Westinghouse kind of way, buys some patents from, he kind of looks at the thing he wants to make, he buys some British patents that had existed before Edison, he combines them with some American patents, he ends up being connected to Nikola Tesla, getting connected with Nikola Tesla, who I'll talk about in a second, um, uh, licenses some patents from Tesla, and sort of makes this big patent booyah base into which he constructs his product, um, which is just better. Um, is, and, and this is where the lawsuit that is at the heart of this book comes from. At this point, um, Edison, West, Westinghouse starts selling these bulbs. Edison sues him for patent infringement. Um, the value of this lawsuit, uh, as estimated by someone on Edison's team, was a billion dollars in 1888. Um, which was the sort of money you might imagine was worth going to court over uh, in the 1880s. So I would argue it's the most valuable lawsuit in American history um, because it's the light bulb. I mean, everyone knew the revenues weren't actually that high at that point, but it, it was so obviously going to be going to take off. Um, so, um, so that is what my book is about. It's actually about this rivalry as told from the perspective of a guy named Paul Cravath, who is a lawyer. Um, he's the lawyer who Westinghouse hires to be the lead litigator on his case. Um, and this was a crazy thing that Westinghouse did. Um, Westinghouse hires as his lead litigator a 26-year-old attorney, 18 months out of Columbia Law School, who had never tried a case before, much less had a client, and makes him the lead litigator on the largest, what I would argue is the largest lawsuit in American history. Because um, he, like, believed in the kid. And, you know, it was this crazy thing. And so um, uh, I won't go into the whole story because you can read it in the book, but so the book is about this whole story as told from the perspective of Paul Cravath, this real lawyer who is kind of our lens into this world of these rivalries between the inventors. Um, from my perspective, one of the things that I was interested in was when I'd written the imitation game, we were very focused on making it kind of a mathematician's story from the from the mathematician's perspective. So it was the whole thing we always talked about was this is Alan Turing's this is Alan Turing's story as told by Alan Turing, which means he is also not necessarily a reliable narrator. This is how he, we want to tell his life story the way he would have told it to you. Um, and then sort of conversely then when I went into Last Days of Night, it was like, let's do the opposite. Let's tell the Edison Westinghouse Tesla story from none of their perspectives, from the perspective of a non-scientist a layman who's just trying to wade through these waters that are way over his head. Um, uh, and I got excited by that opposite approach um, to, to thinking about narrativizing the story. Um, but so, so, so this is the rivalry between Edison and Westinghouse, and I think that's... What was interesting to me about Westinghouse is that I feel like he, he never gets enough credit. Like, he's so, it was, it was so kind of non-sexy, even to the press at the time, but he really does, his patent booyah base is really good. Like, and um, it's, without getting lost in the weeds of the ACDC war, like, that, Westinghouse is the guy who makes it work, and make it work really well. Um, and I, I think that it's this, it represented, in some sense, their antipathy towards each other was because of these opposite conceptions of what, what the role of the inventor was, what the role of someone putting technology into society is. Edison was all about promulgation. It was like, let's sell people lots of light bulbs, put them in their homes. Westinghouse was so much more, let's take the time and the effort and let's make something great. Let's make something really, really good and we're not gonna be first. It's gonna take longer and it's gonna take a lot of resources and it might be harder to explain to people why it's so great. He kept getting into this problem where then when he finally is selling these things, um, Edison sort of just keeps lying about the various products. And Westinghouse's system is demonstrably better than Edison's in a lot of ways, but Edison is very smart and so just, just lies and just says, oh, no, 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 all the ways that my system is bad, actually those are good things in the way that your thing is good, actually those are bad things. Um, it was very, uh, techniques that have not fallen out of favor, uh, in, in the time sense. So, so this was something that was so, um, uh, yeah, Wissingham had, and he, Wissingham did not do a very good job of explaining to people why his stuff was so much better, but that was what was most important to him. Um, and I think in this rivalry of kind of like salesmen versus craftsmen, 
you see a lot of the technological issues that will sort of carry through uh, to, to today. Um, and then finally, we come to Nikola Tesla, the most, the most colorful character in this whole saga. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of mythologizing about Nikola Tesla. Um, he's, he's a cult hero in this really funny way, uh, or has somehow become one after his death. Um, and I think he would be pleasantly surprised by that, but certainly surprised. Um, he, so Tesla had a background much more like Edison's. He was um, very poor growing up in a small town in what is now Serbia. He moved to Paris for a bit. Um, he was, for those who don't know, he was, uh, I think the modern word that we would use to describe him is schizophrenic. That was not a word that existed in the 1880s, but I've talked to a lot of doctors about this, and I think it is, I would suggest it as an apt, it's always hard to diagnose people 100 years later, but he had visions, he heard voices, people talked to him. He talks in his autobiography about how these visions and voices directly inspired all of his inventions. Um, he was, uh, all these uh, kind of difficult OCD things, he would only eat food the cubic volume of which was divisible by three, which is really specific uh, as a phobia. Um, he, uh, he had a hard time uh, being around, he had a hard time being around women, um, which I think a lot of people there had been sort of rumors during his life that maybe he was gay or, or, uh, or just like a disgusting misogynist, but I don't think either were true. He had this thing where he couldn't, he couldn't stand, um, he was very afraid of hair. Like anyone's hair falling on him really scared him. He would go into these fits and women had long hair. And so when they get close, he got really nervous that one of the long hairs would fall on him. So he kind of famously would have a hard time with anyone with long hair. Um, he was, a, peculiar uh, guy, um, but also certainly a genius. And so he goes from, kind of moves his way through Paris. He gets a job at like a little Edison subsidiary there, um, talks to someone, one of Edison's guys, who's like, oh, you should move to, move to New York. New York's where it's all happening. That's where the industry is. Um, you should go, go, go talk to Thomas Edison. He'll hire you. He'll give you a job. Um, so Tesla's like, okay, and he does. He, he comes, there's this story that he tells that, as far as we can tell, seems to be true, even though this sounds so made up. So I'm going to tell it to you as if it's true, but it sounds made up, even though I think it's real. Um, uh, he comes to New York with like, literally a nickel in his pocket, marches into Edison's office, which I think it's the Fifth Avenue one, uh, and uh, he somehow like talks his way in, gets a meeting, and the guys are like, who are you? Oh, yeah, Paris. Okay, uh, that's great. We're like not hiring right now. And he's like, no, I'm Nikola Tesla. I'm a really good inventor. You should hire me for a job. He says, um, they say, uh, okay, well, we have this thing that just broke um, in our other location. We have this machine that's broken. Uh, the guy needs to come from Boston. The only guy who knows how to fix it is in Boston right now. He's coming back, but he can't come till next week. So it's this whole thing. We're waiting for this guy to fix it. If you can, we'll leave you. We'll let you stay here tonight. If you can fix it tonight. Uh, we'll give you a job tomorrow morning. And they like leave the office snickering and are like, ha, 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 this crazy guy is going to be here all night and no one knows how to fix it. So sure enough, they show back up tomorrow morning and he fixes it. Uh, and even though it was something, it was like a, it was a motor. It was something that he didn't have any background in whatsoever. He just like figured out how it worked and fixed it. And uh, so they hire him and he goes to work in Edison's lab for a while. He lasts. Not that long, uh, because the sort of rigid confines of Edison's laboratory were this idea of like having to build everything to see if they don't work just drove him crazy. Uh, it was he was so and then frankly, the idea of building anything drove him crazy. He hated it. He gets in a huge fight with Edison, um, quits, uh, kind of goes off on his own for a while, um, very quietly on his own, makes these kind of wonderful pioneering uh, inventions towards alternating current, um, does this demonstration, Westinghouse sees the demonstration, hires him, licenses his patents, Edison goes, or Tesla goes to work for Westinghouse for a bit, lasts, I think, less than six months in Pittsburgh working for Westinghouse for exactly the same reasons um, that Westinghouse is so focused on like perfecting everything and Tesla doesn't really care. I mean, he's just like, uh, why? It doesn't need to be perfect. It works. It, it basically works. We're fine. Anyway, he, he wanted to move on to neon. And everyone was like, no, but we, we just have like incandescent light kind of working. Hang out here for a minute. 
uh, Neon is next decade. Um, and why he wanted to move on to wireless telephones. The telephone had just started working. Uh, and he was bored by it. And so he had this kind of, uh, so he leaves Westinghouse and then kind of never invents anything that works again. He has all these great ideas, but none of them ever work. And so this is my sort of thing about the mythologizing of Nikola Tesla. He was certainly a genius. Um, he did not have a great track record of making functional objects, in that he never made one. Um, and so, but I, to give him the credit that is certainly due him, conceptually his ideas under, were the underpinnings of Edison's entire system and Westinghouse's entire system. And conceptually he was the genius that made all of this possible. Um, so, so Tesla, who uh, you know, gets screwed out of the royalties by Westinghouse to the system, um, ends up dying penniless and alone in a single room in the Hotel New Yorker uh, in 1941, I think, uh, with only his pet pigeon, who was his only friend, uh, to keep him company in his final hours. Um, which We have pictures of this pigeon, by the way, and if you ever want to just cry alone at your desk for a minute, just like Google Nikola Tesla's pigeon. Uh, it's Oh, it's so sad. He, he was his only friend. Like, a pigeon was the only thing he could hang out with. Um, and uh, so, so his story ends, ends very tragically. Um, but, but so he presented to me, and my whole big framework for this was that if, if, Edison was, if Edison was the salesman and Westinghouse was the craftsman, Tesla was the idea guy. I mean, he was the one who, it was big ideas, and, and they were brilliant, or they, his track record of kind of brilliant and crazy was maybe less than 50-50, um, but the brilliant ones were really brilliant. And, uh, but then he just didn't care about the actual engineering required to build these things, it was so boring to him. Um, he would just kind of walk away before finishing everything. So even when he goes off to start his own company, it's like he never finishes these proje projects. Um, and, uh, and so to me, I got so excited about these three different ideas about what it means to make stuff. Um, and I think I was all the time in my work, uh, kind of writing, writing fiction and film, you know, do I feel like an Edison, a Westinghouse, a Tesla? Um, do I care about the audience? Do I care about the thing itself? Or like Tesla, do I just care about only myself, only my own ideas and knowing the idea is good and knowing that in principle it works and screw everybody else? And um, I think that that's, I think I'm really interested in sort of applying that framework to, to other people. And I think the trick is, you know, you look at uh, people who work anywhere in creative fields and, or technological fields, and it's, it's, I think you see the same dynamics at play. What I would suggest is that you need a little bit of all three. Like, you can't do anything really great, certainly not anything as great on the level of a light bulb. Um, without a bit of Edison, a bit of Westinghouse, and a bit of Tesla. All three components are required um, to come up with something that earth-shattering. Um, so I have now been talking for a little bit. Uh, is there anything that any of you would like to talk about or ask? So just raise your hand and you can ask. Um, I'll come to you. So it seems like you've done uh, multiple novels now, kind of set in the same-ish time period. Mm -hmm. um, but they're all like strictly, well, mostly nonfiction, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it's. I was just reading the description of it, uh, this novel before I came here. It seems. It seems sort of vaguely steampunk-esque, especially you know, literally, we're talking about when electricity is first being used. Um, have you ever? Like, do, are you inspired by that kind of stuff? Like, you know, Neil Stevenson, kind of, you know, um, Baroque cycle, any of that? Yeah, like, I, um, uh, I love Neil Stevenson. Um, I love the Baroque cycle. Um, by your question, I gather that you may be the second other person I've ever met who has actually read all of the Baroque cycle. Because um, it's, it is a lot. Uh, really, I'm glad that people here do it. Because I, I know one other person, like, in my life who's made it all the way through the Baroque cycle. Um, uh, which is wonderful. Yeah, he's, I mean, he's right. I think uh, Cryptonomicon was wonderful. Like, uh, Stevenson's treatment of Alan Turing in Cryptonomicon, I adored. Um, it was such a great, like, fantastical, like, fable version of the Alan Turing story. Um, it was one of my favorite fictional, fictional Turings. Um, and, I mean, there's a lot of them. There's a lot of different 
kind of treatments of Turing. And um, yeah, I like that stuff. I mean, I think um, uh, what's cool to me about some of the steampunk stuff is this, uh, um, it, these kind of like predictive pasts, like looking at the past the same way we sort of, we've been a tri a occasioned by science fiction to look at the future. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's another way of kind of narrativizing the past based on the questions we're asking ourselves now, um, which I think is a lot of what, what I do. I mean, I'm sort of in from my first book to my second book to the film I wrote, like, I'm really interested in these telling stories about the past and about real people um, in some way through these modern lenses and, and crafting because that's the way I'm looking at them. And I, and I think in some sense that's the way everyone looks at the past. Um, I don't think there's, you know, we're always, we're always rewriting our histories um, and we're always kind of framing things through new, through new lenses. Um, and I think that's some of the exciting stuff about like speculative pasts. Um, uh, it's, it's exciting to see it's like our predictions about the past, our predictions about how we will view the past in the future keep being wrong. Um, and that's something that's really interesting to me. Like we keep rewriting these narratives. I mean, you see it with some of the Turing stuff, the way Turing was sort of forgotten and then not forgotten and then forgotten again. People kind of flip back and forth on him a little bit. Um, I feel like we're just, we're due for a good wave of Turing backlash now. Um, it's probably about that time. Uh, so it'll be like 10 years when no one cares about him anymore. Uh, and then 10 years later, someone will start caring again. Uh, Tesla goes through the same thing, right? He goes through these really funny phases of hitting some pop culture um, zeitgeist moment um, where there's a lot of books or, or films or TV or something about Tesla. Um, and if, I, he seems to be easy to, or, or people seem to really like turning him into these like fantastical narratives. He always ends up being this like fantastical character who, um, when I was saying earlier about the people talk about scientists as if they're magicians, like Tesla always ends up turning into a magician in people's narratives. I think it's really funny. Um, like they keep ascribing these things to him that are literally magic. Um, and it's like, but he was a scientist. Like he wouldn't have been into that. Um, okay. Uh, so it's, it's funny. It's funny seeing how like the historical Tesla changes in our imagination from decade to decade from he had a little period in the 1890s where he got very famous. And then by 1910, no one cared again. And, you know, he goes through these phases. Um, so that's, and, and I think a lot of the really cool steampunk writing is part of that conversation, which I think is a conversation I'm very excited to be a small part of. Uh, anybody else? Jeff? Hey, Graham. Thanks Hi. for coming out. Thanks. Um, we went to college together for those of you who know. <laughs> I would be here anyway. Um, so I have some experience reading. I haven't read um, your new book yet. I do have some experience like reading, uh, I guess, treatments that are nonfiction of historical events. And sometimes you kind of get this uncanny valley feeling hmm. where there's like details from the past that are inserted in the book. And you're like, oh, you know, so-and-so is walking down a rainy street on this day, and it's like, was it really rainy? How, and, and it seems like as an author, you kind of have to strike a balance between like really wanting to paint the picture and take the reader to make them feel like you know so-and-so is actually happening, versus you know having a nagging feeling in the back of somebody's head. You know, did somebody really say that, or was it really you know X Y Z? So I just hmm. wondering what your approach was to like doing the research and striking balance between like finding this really great fact and throwing it in a book that, you know, you know it's true, but somebody else might think, hey, you know, did this actually happen or did so-and-so really think this? And, you know, it, yeah. I, I guess there's good and bad for going, like, hyper-detailed versus just, like, a bare statement of facts. And as, you know, an author, you probably want to make it a little bit more interesting. So curious how you approach that. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I mean, that is, the question that you're asking is, like, is the... That, that is my job, that is what, that is the primary problem that I am tackling most days as I sit at my desk. Um, especially in a story like this where some things are documented, far from everything is documented. Um, 
you know, at one point uh, towards the end of the writing process, um, when I was getting near the last draft, um, the I sat with my research assistant who works with me, and uh, we went through and highlighted every line of the novel uh, in, with a highlighter with three different colors. One for things we knew were true and could prove. Uh, another for things that we think were probably true, but we can't prove it. Um, and then a third color for things we know did not happen, but we're going to do it anyway. Um, and so I have, I think I threw it out. I should have saved the copy of the like rainbow colored uh, printout because um, it would be cool to show to people. Um, but so, and then it's actually the, the product of that was there's a 10 page note at the end of this book um, that goes through kind of all the major events of the book and says, and tries to kind of divide them into these categories. Say like, we can prove this. I think this, but I can't prove it. I know this didn't happen, but here's why I'm having it happen here because it's amalgamating three different real incidents that happened at different times. But I needed one for narrative purposes to sort of get through it. And then we actually uh, on the website for the book we put up this thing that I love, where you can see because a lot of what I had to do is timeline fudging. Um, like most of the events of the book did happen. Very few of them happened in that order. Um, and so, and the, the, essentially what was a six year process gets compressed to two and there's all these, it's a lot of amalgamation to get a story that complicated into these things. So there's a lot of different disparate events that get enmeshed into one, different characters get enmeshed in one. It's a lot of the same te techniques. Um, we used on Imitation Game, taking characters and smushing them together, taking time periods and fudging them. My favorite thing about the Imitation Game is when does Pearl Harbor happen in that movie? You don't know. We, it's not an accident. Um, uh, being sort of intentionally fudging timelines. So, so it's a lot of techniques like that. Um, and uh, we, um, you, you know, I think that could, because the trick is, so on the website, we, we show you two timelines. You can see the real timeline of everything that happened, and then you can see the book timeline. You can scroll through them and see where they match and where they don't. But we, um, you know, the goal of these things, and I think the, the, the purpose of these techniques is to, um, is to tell, a tr tell the story responsibly. Um, and so especially for something like this, where we have so much that's not documented. Um, you know, we don't know what went on in the room between George Westinghouse and Paul Cravath. Like, we weren't there. Um, uh, you know, funny twist to the story, by the way, there's this, um, as part of the process, I went to the, the offices of the law firm that now bears Paul Cravath's name. Um, they're in Midtown. And this is while I was researching, and I go in, and I get a meeting with a managing partner. He's this like very scary white shoe law firm guy. Um, and we have this whole meeting where he's like, "I was like, so. Do you have anything about Paul Cravath? You know, the firm's been around for. You walk into the firm, and they show you a chair given to them by Abraham Lincoln. Like that's how they establish what they're about. And uh, it does not look particularly comfortable." Um, but, uh, so I asked them, like, what the, um, uh, they have any documents, and the guy's like, well, so, I mean, w we do have this box of letters between George Westinghouse and Paul Cravath. I said, oh, thank you, that's exactly what I'm looking for, uh, can you let me see this box of letters? And the guy says, uh, well, you know, actually I can't. Uh, you might not know this, and I certainly didn't at the time, but uh, attorney-client privilege is not waived by death. So those records are, st uh, those letters are still protected by attorney-client privilege, and we can't, we can't show them to you. And my response, of course, was to try and make a joke out of it and be like, oh, I get it, I get it. So maybe you just show me the room where the letters are in. You leave for five minutes, nobody asks a question. Like, I get it. And he like, gets really serious. And it's like, we're a major law firm, and that's not funny. We would never do that with our clients' proprietary information. How dare you even suggest that? Blah, blah. And I was like, shit, I got it. OK. Um, I was just kidding. Um, so this has now become, I've gone back into some events at the firm, um, and they're lovely. Uh, but they, this has become a running joke where they still refuse to get me access to this box. So if anyone here knows a way to get me into this box, I can give you its address. Um, it's, it's a physical box, so I need if, like, someone who has, like, knows a janitor who works nights, who has a card that I can get in. This may get to the level of, like, a heist. Um, uh, we can talk about that afterwards. But uh, the point of the story is that, yeah, so I don't have those letters. Um, 
I don't think I ever will. There's so much that we don't know. So it's about a lot of making educated guesses and trying to distill, trying to distill complicated narratives. And anyone's life is complicated. Trying to distill them responsibly, um, you know, to say, and to try and tell people's story the way I think they would have described it. Like the, the goal with this book, Paul Cravath, our uh, ambitious, in over his head young lawyer, he is our narrator. So it's his version of the story. I'm gonna, the idea was to tell the Edison Westinghouse Tesla rivalry from Paul's perspective, which means that it's the narrative is constructed the way a lawyer would look at it, not the way a scientist would look at it. Um, and so the kind of amalgamations and fudgings and kind of what we leave in, what you leave out, um, is, is what he would do. Um, and that's the kind of guiding principle behind the use of the techniques I was describing earlier. And as I was saying, the same, you know, the opposite was true with imitation, where it was like, okay, if you asked Alan Turing what was important to him, what would he tell you about? Um, and, you know, there's all this voiceover in the movie. It, it's literally constructed as this kind of unreliable narrator where you only see the stuff as he tells it to you. Um, so, so, so that's where these techniques come, but it's all about trying to get, if all storytelling is subjective, it is about trying to craft, um, craft a subjective version of the story that I think is most responsible and fair to the central figures in it. There's a long answer. Um, anybody else? Boys or minutes? Uh, you mentioned uh, earlier the sort of fantastic ideas that Tesla created after sort of getting out of both of these organizations that never, that were impractical failures. Uh, and then a bit later on in the Q&A, you talked about the sort of representations of Tesla in film and television being this wildly fantastic creator. It, we were speaking earlier about the prestige, and in mm -hmm. there he invents a, a teleportation device. Yeah, uh, he invents there... a tele teleportation device and then decides that the best application of this technology is a magician's feud. Um, and I like the prestige a lot, don't get me wrong, it's a, I really love it. Uh, it is, if you look at it from Tesla's perspective, wh why would he, go on. Uh, my, my question though is, are there real world examples of some of these fantastic ideas that are just practical failures? Um, in, in Tesla's life? Yeah, I mean, he, um, so right after the light bulb, um, it's a great question, right after the light bulb, he got really obsessed with, it was a couple projects, um, neon, wireless telephones, w and a machine to talk to God. Um, and in his mind, these were three equally plausible, equally challenging tasks. Um, and so here's what's funny, neon act like works, right? Like neon lights are a thing, and he's uh, pretty important in terms of developing them. Um, wireless telephones will turn out to work, just he was 50 years too far ahead, he was so far away from anything, I mean telephones just barely worked. Um, so it was like, sort of his idea was right, but not, he was in the wrong century for it. Like the technology wasn't anywhere near where he thought it was. And then the, yeah, machine to talk to God, he was probably less close to <laughs> than his other ideas. Um, so it was all these, kind of, yeah, I don't know what his other fantastical things were. Oh, but then he did, but then he would go on to do this kind of really pioneering stuff on x-rays um, uh, or uh, shadow graphs, as he called them, um, but refused to take any credit for it and didn't, he didn't really want the patents, he didn't really care. He was like, ah, it works, it's cool. And then he sort of drifted off. Like x-rays are an example of something where he did a lot of really great work um, and I think, I think he actually uh, talked to Wilhelm Röntgen, is Röntgen, is that how you pronounce it? The German guy who invented x-rays. Um, and uh, I think they were, like, they were like pen pals. And, but Tesla didn't want any credit, like he didn't care. It was just, oh, Wilhelm will do it. Like, let's, he can finish it. Um, and so, you know, when you Wikipedia who invented the x-ray, it's Wilhelm Röntgen. And, and I think that that sort of tends to be so yeah, was the x-ray project, it was not necessarily a failure on the machine to talk to God level, because he did do all this work, but then didn't quite see it through. So, so a lot of his stuff was like that. And there was no, if you read his own writings and interviews on the subject, it's fascinating because there's no, he has no ability to distinguish or interest in distinguishing between the totally nuts 
and the like semi practical. There's just he he talks about them all in the same breath. Um, and, and maybe that's what enabled him to do such pioneering work. The fact that these things, the God Machine was as viable to him as an X-ray or a neon light. Um, but I think it also, uh, you know, it held him back. And he didn't look at one as like any more of a failure than the other. Like they all sort of, I think he sort of felt like he got the God Machine to kind of work. He'd sketched out something. I, I don't know what it did. Um, I don't know that he knew what it did. Um, so, yes, and I think that's what makes him, in some ways, such a romantic figure. Because it is romantic, right? This, this belief, it, it seems almost naive, this idea that we can do anything and that anything is possible. Um, and you need people like Westinghouse and Edison to sort of say, well, no, not anything is possible. I mean, <laughs> we are scientists. Like, there's a, there's a range here. Um, but... Um, yeah, and I think that's part of the reason why Tesla has become such a romantic figure in the popular imagination, like in The Prestige, which, again, I did not mean to talk shit about The Prestige. I think it's really good, but uh, it's a funny version of Tesla. Uh, yeah? You said something at the beginning that really caught my ear, and it was uh, you woke up one day and you said, you know what, I'm a professional writer. I'm an idea guy. From now on, the bills get paid by ideas. So that implies there was a before. There was yes. a before and after. There was a before with a nine to five job, presumably, and then you were an idea guy. Can you tell us about the transition from one to the other and what prompted it? What was the trigger? What's the evolution from one to the other? Sure. Um, uh, yes, I liked it in your description. I was able to get out of bed after this transition occurred. I think it, my experience was more uh, abject terror um, that would prevent me from, from going to my desk for a little bit. But um, yeah, I mean, I was, I've been writing um, little bits kind of throughout, throughout the aughts um, and uh, after college and whatnot. And you know, I'd been writing, I had started, I started my first novel um, in 2004. Um, so, and that was where I'd done little bits of fiction writing before, but nothing, some screenplays and stuff, but nothing professionally. I was actually a sound engineer. That was my day job for five years in my 20s, um, was as an audio engineer. I was not very good at it, but paid the rent. And um, in some sense, I think I approach everything from like an engineering perspective. Like I always sort of wish I was an engineer. I'm just not that good at it. Um, so, but I would always sort of be, I would be writing. Um, and then I moved to, um, I moved to LA in 2009 and I got a couple jobs. I wrote on a TV sitcom for six months and got a couple little jobs in Hollywood while I was finishing my first novel. Um, and I think uh, the dividing line in my life, it's funny because I think people, people will point to, I have this experience now where people talk about the Academy Awards or something like that and say, like, God, didn't that change your life? And I always have to say, not really. The thing that changed my life, the actual change, was in the summer of 2009. Um, you know, I was leaving my time in the sitcom and I'd kind of been like going from job to job but nothing I was particularly satisfied by and um, nothing that seemed particularly long-term. And I got a call from my book agent that um, uh, my first novel had sold. And uh, it, was, it was the kind of thing where I was like, oh, I don't, this is now my job. I can go do this now. I can just go write books. And um, that's crazy. Um, so I actually then at that point, in my overdramatic way, uh, I was living in LA and I moved back to New York. I was like, oh, I'm gonna, um, I'm just gonna go be a novelist and I live in New York and I'm not gonna write screenplays anymore and I'm not gonna work in Hollywood because I hate Hollywood and it was stupid and I didn't like it. Um, I'm just gonna write this one last script about Alan Turing because uh, I told my friend I would and no one was paying me. It was just something I was doing with my friends because we said we wanted to. And so, and I had enough money for my first novel that I could say, oh, okay, I can take six months off and, um, and just write the script and send it off to LA and then like go back to my real job, which is, I was just starting last days, um, and finish that. Um, and then the six months turned into a year, and then two years, and then five years uh, for very happy reasons. Um, but I was glad then to get a chance to actually finish this novel, which I'd kind of been working on the whole time. Um, but so I think that moment of like, oh, okay, this is what my job is going to be. Like, this is a professional, this is a thing. Like, I don't need to do anything else for a little while. Um, was 
it was sort of terrifying. And I think that's why I sort of, I started looking at these scientists and saying like, okay, how did these people do it? Like, how did they have ideas for a living? And, you know, it's not, I think when it goes, I think when something goes from being a hobby to a profession, there is, there's the bit where you, you maybe aren't, you have to make yourself comfortable with the fact that maybe you're not feeling super inspired that day, but this is your job and people depend on you and people have invested resources and time and energy in your work. And so you sit at your desk and you do your job. And, uh, you know, like any other job, it's not that glamorous or cool. It's just what you do. Um, and um, it's funny, now, I'm just in the very early phases of starting a third book. And it's, um, it's funny kind of reapproaching that and with some sense of like, yeah, this is, this is my job. This is my profession. This is a craft. Um, and I want to get better at it. Uh, I want to, I want my third book to be better than my second. Um, I want my second movie to be better than my first. Um, so far it seems like it will be, uh, knock on something. Um, but yeah, I think that was, it was, it was, that was a really profound emotional shift for me. And I think it's something that I have six years later, still kind of grapple with. Um, so it is 2.05 by the clock I see in front of me. Is that right? Yeah. Um, so I know we need to wrap up. If there's anything. Okay. Yeah, I think. We should call it? Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Um, the books are in the back. Thank you, everybody.